Hello, everyone. It's me again. Uh, I'm recording here. Uh, so we, I recorded the, I just recorded the narrated syllabus, and I see that it's about 40 minutes. And so in order to make sure that we make effective use of the 75 minutes that were allocated for the first class on Tuesday, in which I am not physically present or available for um, a synchronous online presentation, uh, I'm jumping right into the notes. And so I've um, posted the first slide um, deck, the first um, collection of slides. And what I'd like to do in this recording is take about a half an hour's time to go through the first 20 of those slides. So the slide deck will be just as good for us to work on on Thursday the 20th, um, uh, probably be done by the end of that day. And I'll have a new slide deck um, posted shortly thereafter, well in advance of the class on Tuesday the 25th. All right, so let's jump right into it. The first slide deck starts with this slide here. Who am I? Well, you've already gone through a, a huge 40-minute um, uh, spiel about what the course is, and I'm not sure that this tells you much more other than it gives you a, what is now a very old picture of me about 19 years uh, ago. Um, in my third year of being a professor at the University of Minnesota, um, this is a picture that was actually on the bridge, the Washington Avenue Bridge, um, sort of uh, decoupaged onto the bridge uh, as part of a, a campaign, a sort of talking heads campaign, um, I am you stand with me. And that was by an office that doesn't exist anymore called the GLBT programs office in a building that doesn't exist anymore called Claybor Court. Uh, so much has changed, so much has changed. The name of our department is no longer communication disorders. Okay, well, you know, whenever we're talking about any course here, one of the things that we need to think about is not just what is it, what do we aspire for the end state of this course to be? And so the syllabus has those six objectives for the course, um, but also a sense of how will you know that you've learned anything? How will you know that anything that we've done in this course is, uh, has made a meaningful change in your knowledge and skills? Well, for this, we need to think about kind of what your baseline is. So um, if you if I look at the um, phonetic transcriptions that folks have posted on the, uh, the name coach roster on Canvas, um, the baseline is variable. Some people um, phonetically transcribe their names using phonetic symbols. Other people um, transcribe them using uh, a sort of spelled, phonetically spelled version of their name. But the baseline for that is highly variable. And that's fine. Everybody comes to the task with a different set of, of prior knowledge. Um, so that's one baseline. Um, but another baseline is to engage in this task. And so um, you know, one of the things that phonetic transcription uh, and knowledge of the science of phonetics will give us is a vocabulary, a language, a framework for talking about speech that is just different than the vocabulary and language and framework that we have um, with our, our general knowledge, right? So one of the things that I ask you to do, and remember in the syllabus, we talked about um, having a little portfolio of your knowledge and skills in phonetics. This is something that you could do informally um, to keep a record of your knowledge and skills growth over the course of the semester, is to think of a famous person with a very distinctive way of speaking, distinctive pronunciation. Uh, it's sometimes hard to think about distinctive pronunciation separately from other aspects of language like distinctive word use, et cetera. It's hard to think about a distinctive way of speaking as separate from a distinctive way of dressing or a distinctive way of wearing one's hair or distinctive makeup or something like that. Um, and that's for good reason. Um, not sure that we'll necessarily get into it in this course, but um, you know, phonetic variation is just one of the many ways that we construct our persona, right? But again, back to the slide, think of a famous person with a very distinctive pronunciation, with a very distinctive pronunciation, the distinctive way of speaking. How would you describe that person's way of speaking to a fellow student in this class? Keeping in mind that although the baseline in this class is variable, some people have had more exposure to this topic than others, you're all novices in the general sense. So with your educated and engaged, but probably um, disciplinarily green, you know, sort of beginner phonetician knowledge, how would you describe that person's way of speaking to a fellow student in this class? Um, how would you describe that person's way of speaking to someone who shares your education level but has never had any specialized training? So if you think about, you know, 90% of the people in this class being majors in linguistics or speech language hearing sciences, 
um, you know, you all have some sense of, of uh, a general vocabulary to talk about language. How would you make that same description to someone who you could assume none of that shared knowledge with? Um, and so one of the things to do, and to, one of the reasons to really do this is um, that we, we will come back to this on the last day of class and ask you to revisit the person who you chose and some of the words that you thought of to describe that person and see what's changed. And I see right now, I need to stop sharing and reshare and make sure when I reshare that I optimize for video clips and share the sound on my computer. Okay. All right. Now you can ask yourself the same thing about this child. And so I'm gonna press this button and I'm gonna hope that the recording goes to your screen. I know that the video gets super choppy when you um, play a YouTube video on a, a presented slide on Zoom recording. So also note to self to share this YouTube clip on your Canvas site so that you can access it directly. All right. so um, what you're gonna see is a child. The child is named Elise. This is a clip I show a lot. So if you've seen me guest lecture in other courses like SLHS 1401 slash 3401, you may have seen this clip before. This is a little girl who is um, having her speech assessed for speech sound disorder, which is a condition we'll talk about um, in the, throughout the semester, probably something Liz will talk about. And what you're gonna see is this girl um, being shown pictures and she's going to uh, name what she seats. All right, we're ready to get started. Can you tell us your name? Lisey Bear. Lisey Bear. Oh, wonderful. So, Elise, every time you see a picture, I want you to use your really loud, big girl voice so we can all hear you, okay? Okay. All right, here we go. Here's the first one. Look at my picture, and can you tell me what this is called? A house. Beautiful. I love how you used that big voice. That was great. What's this called? Um, a door. Very nice. You're doing a great job, Elise. What is that? A paint. Good. What is this? A top. Perfect. She is a girl and he is a... A dog. Let's say he is a boy. Okay, so, um, so Lisi was naming five pictures there, and some of the words are ones that you probably could tell. Others were ones that you, you might not have been able to tell. Um, house, door, cup was that uh, the second to last word. Um, so how would you think, ask yourself how you would describe this child's speech, right? Um, what are some of the, the terms that we, you would use to describe this child's speech if you were describing it to a fellow member of your class, someone who you could uh, assume had some prior knowledge. Of course, there are no prerequisites in this course, at least an interest and engagement in the topic of this course versus someone who might never have thought about speech or language or hearing their entire careers. You know, they might be in, in a, another field entirely and just never have thought about these topics. Last, let's, oops, let's actually not skip ahead. Uh, last, let's um, uh, ask yourself about the same thing about this woman. And so um, who we are looking at right now is Aisha Rasko. So Aisha Rasko is a, a I, I don't, I have not checked her affiliation lately, but um, when I posted this, when I created this slide last year, she was still a White House reporter for NPR. And, um, you know, because I don't go, um, because I don't drive much anymore. I don't listen to NPR very much anymore. And so it's been quite some time since I've listened to NPR long enough to see whether or not she's um, still a, a White House reporter. But uh, at the time she was a White House reporter and she was a White House reporter through pretty much all of the previous presidential administration. So I'm gonna hopefully be able to scroll ahead to minute 1330 in this. Oh yes, I can, good, good, good. Please tell me we're not gonna get it commercial. But NPR to to not only hear your amazing reporting, but to also hear myself affirmed through your voice, right, meant that I could actually do what you can do, right? Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, and and that's truly coming from a coming from a um, a really you know good place. And we can actually talk about this later. <laughs> no, but thank you. No, but, it's a lot. <laughs> my first question is, uh, what made you get into journalism in the first place? 
Well, thank you so much for that, and thank you for and and I and I'll just say about my voice and everything, and we may get into it more later. But I, you know, when I got onto radio, I was just talking as myself. I really didn't think that I was doing anything that was out of the ordinary. But I think that what people have responded to is hearing a voice that is very familiar to them, uh, but hasn't always been familiar in public media or even on TV or that you just don't hear a lot. Okay, so the great Aisha Rasko. Um, and that's a, a great clip to watch, right? Um, and I think a great clip uh, to start a course that aspires to talk about issues of linguistic justice and social justice um, as, a, as a foreground to everything else we talk about. So the specific clip there was the interviewer who was um, beginning her um, interview with Aisha Rasko by talking about how positively and how, um, how affirmative, how, how positive and affirming it was to hear Aisha Rasko's voice on the radio. And then uh, Ms. Rasko talks about her, her voice and, you know, sort of her, her, her own understanding of the way she was talking and sort of her goals. So we will talk much more about this um, in the context of talking about African-American language, something that you may have heard in other courses referred to as African-American English or African-American vernacular English. In this course, we use the more widely accepted and more socially just term African-American language. Um, talking so when we talk about African American language, we'll we'll revisit this. But ask yourself right now, how would you describe Aisha Rasko's way of speaking to other people? And you can talk about this in terms of the pronunciation of specific words or or anything else. Um, and in fact, you actually have a model of how the uh, how this could be done in um, the interviewer's uh, you know framing of that question. Okay. So in this course, we're studying human speech, or as I would say it, human speech. <laughs> in this course, we're studying human speech. Why do humans speak? Well, speech is one of the physical media for transmitting and comprehending language, right? We do not speak because it's necessary to do so to take in nutrients or to oxygenate our blood. We speak because speaking is one of the physical media for transmitting and comprehending language ideas about the world. Now, it's not the only way of uh, transmitting and comprehending language. So written language is another form, writing and reading, and signing, the visual modality. Signing is another modality. Um, and we could talk about the phonetics of sign language if, um, if I knew more about them and if the courses, if the uh, texts in phonetics um, engaged with sign language as deeply as they engage with, engage with spoken languages. Um, so there, you know, all of those languages have a, a phonetic structure. All of, I'm sorry, all of those modalities have a phonetic, a phonetic structure. Um, we're talking about the phonetic structure of the the spoken and heard, the oral, oral, oral modalities of language. Now, pretty much every course on language science has to start, start and talk about how there are two perspectives on studying language a prescriptive perspective, which says how people ought to talk, how people should talk, and a descriptive perspective that describes how people talk. So when we talk about prescriptive approaches, prescriptive grammars, so a prescriptive grammar is just sort of like a catalog of prescriptive statements about language. First of all, it assumes that there is something called a standard grammar, the one right way to speak. And examples of prescriptive grammatical statements are things like, say going to, not gonna, because gonna is a lazy way to speak. Or don't use double negatives. It's illogical. If we take the same phenomena that are um, discussed in those two prescriptive statements and reframe them as um, descriptive statements, um, we are, uh, we are instead, of, instead of saying how someone should talk, we will be describing how people talk and why they talk that way. So examples here are something more descriptive. People say gonna rather than going to at fast rates of speech. So describing when gonna occurs rather, um, as opposed to going to. 
Or if we wanna take this into a more um, phonetic level, making a statement, and this is a, a really only partially true statement, just FYI, saying something like, people from the Northeastern United States make the t sound with the blades of their tongue. People from the Midwest make it with their tongue tips. So your tongue tip is what it sounds like, the very tip of your tongue. The blade of your tongue is the part of your tongue just behind that. Now, this course examines speech from a descriptive perspective. Now, questions we're not answering in this course are things like, what is the right way to speak? So even speech language pathology is really more of a descriptive prescription profession than a prescriptive one, or at least I wish it was. Um, speech language pathology ought to be a more descriptive profession than a prescriptive one. What a speech language pathologist ought to do is describe the mismatch between an individual and what we would expect given typical cognitive, perceptual, and motor development, and then help that individual develop the skills to align their communication with that of their peers without some kind of an underlying problem that prevented them from uh, acquiring the language they were exposed to. So we're not answering the question, what is the right way to speak? We're not answering the question, how can I speak more clearly, right? Um, this is another prescriptive topic and is covered in courses in things like voice and diction outside of this department, things like theater arts, for example. And importantly, this is not a practical course in improving listening or pronunciation. And I put this in here kind of as a caution because there have been a time, a couple of times, and I really mean over the course of 24 years of teaching, probably three times only, so I'm probably making more of this than I need to, where students have registered for this course under the misunderstanding that they would be learning how to improve the way that they speak. Now, part of, in, in part of this uh, answer to what we're not, uh, in part of this discussion of what we're not answering, is a commitment from us, and us really here is mostly me, but um, you know Greta and, and Liz as well, um, and hopefully a commitment from all of you moving forward, is that um, we're always careful to not characterize a single language or even a single person's speech monolithically. That everybody speaks, every language has its own unique way of speaking, and every within each language, uh, every individual has their own unique ways of speaking, which those which themselves vary from moment to moment, from sort of context to context, from situation to situation. Right? There are many right ways where right is put in scare quotes here precisely because this, this uh, calls into question the, the definition of right. There are many right ways to say the sounds that are um, spelled and transcribed with the, the L and the S. There are many right ways to say the, the first sound in words like light or the first sound in words like sight. There are many right ways to say the vowel in the word caught. So some of you might say caught like I do, others might say caught. Our goal is to characterize these differences and to try and uncover why they exist. But hold on a minute. Um, when I say that, uh, where, where was it? Um, when I say that this course examines speech from a descriptive perspective, it's super important that I say that even though we're, des we're describing this from a descriptive perspective, that doesn't mean that we're describing it from a power neutral perspective. So it's not a course that uh, is power neutral or um, ignores or, or denies the sociopolitical context in which language occurs and the sociopolitical values that are associated with different ways of speaking. So hold on a minute. While this course is not explicitly prescriptive, some facts simply can't be denied. Most phonetics research has been completed in academia by academics. And in fact, most of the stuff that hasn't been done in academia has been done in industry by people who have the same training as academics. And over the course of its uh, many centuries of, of existence, academic, academia and academics are overwhelmingly white, and most academic institutions are primarily white-serving institutions. This is true today and has been overwhelmingly true historically. And the research that forms the canon of phonetics knowledge was done by and large by, by white people on white people in white spaces. Now, it's also been done by able-bodied, cisgender people in male-dominated and male-controlled spaces. And the body of knowledge that formed this course reflects this. And here I will um, 
what's the word, not divert, I will, I will digress from my slides for just a second and tell you a story. So these slides that you're seeing right now are only minimally different from the same set of slides that I used last year when I taught this course. So I started out the course last year with this very same set of knowledge. And over the course of the semester, I brought this up again and again. And there was a, a question, an extra credit, credit question, I might add, on the final exam for this course that says, like, you know, list one thing. Well, and I probably ask the same question, but like, list one thing that you really think you learned over the course of the semester and one thing that you feel like you wish you'd learned, but you hadn't. And there's one student in the course who I want to make sure that I say this in a way that is appropriately anonymizing to that student basically said, well, if there's one thing that I learned in this course, it's that I don't speak the right way because every time I think about the way that I speak words, it's different from the way that you spoke them on homework assignments or the way the textbook transcribes them. And I wish I had been, you know, I wish I had known earlier what the right way of saying these words were. And, you know, my, my heart broke, but also I looked in the mirror and said, well, you did not do your job. So when I said that in the mirror, I was saying it to myself, right? Meaning that statements like the ones that I just made are pretty hollow if the materials and procedures in the course don't actively undo them. Meaning that I can say what I'm saying on the slides right now, but if the rest of the semester just falls into the same rabbit hole of the, you know, how many, you know, dozens, well, probably not dozens, but certainly more than a dozen, dozen and a half times I've taught this course, then by the end of the semester, I can hardly blame a person for having internalized that conclusion, right? So I say that right now, first of all, as an admission of, you know, that that simply that words are not enough, right? But also as a, a you know, asking you to be my responsibility buddies on making sure that um, that it's more than just words moving forward. And I've thought about it too. I mean, I'm not just asking you to, to hold me responsible. I've thought of tangible things that I'm doing differently this semester to, to try and uh, minimize the possibility that any one of you will come to, a same, to the same conclusion at the end of this semester. When it's late April, early May, the days are longer, the weather is warm, you know, we can fantasize about the future in whatever way is possible. Now, hold on a minute again. So some other, uh, you know, level setting things that we need to do here is um, when I say American English in the course, what the heck am I talking about? So when I say American English in this course, I'm talking about research done by and on a specific type of speaker of American English. And by doing so, and I really saw this, I guess I could have, I could have waited till the end of the slide to tell you the anecdote about the students um, lecture last, uh, the students exam last semester, is that by doing so, I'm elevating the people who have done that research as the ones who speak a variety worth talking about in a university class. Now, if we think about the prescriptive descriptive divide, you know, what I'm talking about is pretty freaking prescriptive, no matter how much I say it's not. And we need to be aware of that at every term and be part of dismantling that system. And the lesson of last year is that words, you know, that, that the words and procedures and, and tactics that I took last year were not enough for that to, to work for everyone. So we are grounding this course in, in these issues, right? That we will, that we all, and yeah, I'm the, you know, I'm the leader of the course, but we all have a responsibility in, you know, this is a collaborative iterative process, teaching and learning, right? Um, we all have a responsibility to make sure that this course doesn't just fall down the rabbit hole that, you know, led us where we are. And, you know, just to, to emphasize how dire this is, speech language pathology is over 42% white and female. So speech language pathology as a discipline has failed to progress in, in ways that the rest of the society has. And so we have a particular onus on us to think about why that is so and what needs to be done differently so that speech language pathology can, you know, can evolve into a discipline where courses in phonetics don't automatically make people who are uh, from marginalized groups say, wow, I, I didn't realize until I took this course how wrong I was. You know, if a course in phonetics taught by someone who ostensibly wants differently uh, leads to that, one can only imagine what's happening out, there, happening out there in assessment and treatment spaces in the real world. And we can and will do better, and we will inspire each other and ourselves to do so. Hmm. All right, well, what symbols are we going to use when we characterize differences in pronunciation? 
Well, I'll tell you what we're not going to use. We're not just going to use letters. We're not just going to spell things out phonetically. And this is for reasons that are, um, you know, familiar to many of you, but always worth reiterating. And that is that one sound can be represented by many letters. So the sound is represented by the letter F in the word fish, by the sequence of letters. And I will sometimes say digraph. A digraph is just two letters. The digraph um, or letter sequence PH in phone, the digraph GH in enough. Right? And there are good reasons why the, the sound is spelled differently in these different words, but they relate to things that happened centuries ago, not things that happen are happening currently. I mean, it just happens that, uh, for example, the word enough used to be pronounced differently. Um, and when it was pronounced differently, the GH made sense, but the, the pronunciation of that word changed over time. And now it's spelled with a GH, but it's pronounced with a Another great thing about using Zoom and one of the reasons to use it in the classroom is I can get all up in the camera and you can see my mouth really closely without having to have, you know, droplets spewing on you or bad breath. And I drink a lot of coffee. So, you know, I cannot promise good breath in the classroom. Um, and you won't have to worry about that the way that previous generations of in-person phonetic students did. And I don't have to obsessively carry around Altoids. Wow, and you have this on video to show your parents, nice. All right, now, another problem with letters is that you can't, there are many letters where just looking at the letter isn't gonna tell you how it's pronounced. So there's not a one-to-one -one mapping between letters and sounds either. If we see the letter C, it could be a S sound as it, in the word city or a K sound as in the word cake. So as a practical example here, if you transcribe a child's utterance as D-O-E space A space Z-H-L-E-E-P, what did the child say, right? So as you're watching this video, if you're doing it in a place where you can actually say something out loud, uh, read that and ask yourself, what, what do you think that corresponded to in terms of a pronunciation? Right. Now, in contrast, if we transcribe that very same utterance phonetically, using the symbols that are on this slide, then we know that what the child said was something like, go a heap, go a heap. Um, we don't have to worry about people, you know, wh what we know when we see the spelled out thing here is that the child probably didn't say something the way an adult would say it. But when we look here, um, we can see the specific, so we can know the specific sounds that the child said. And by the way, this would be um, this actually something I literally transcribed a child saying once for go to sleep. Okay, this is a slide we will end with for this abbreviated first lecture. Um, and so when we start class on Thursday, first of all, we'll do a lot of introductions and hello and clarifications about the syllabus and su thus and such. Um, but when we jump back into these slides on Thursday, January 20th, the first discussion point I'd like you to engage with is the one here. Do all languages have this same problem? Or do some languages have writing systems that more faithfully respect the, the reflect and respect that more faithfully reflect the sound structure of their languages? So think about that. You know, my answer is on the next slide, but I want you, you all to think about this a little bit yourselves and talk about that on Thursday. Um, and I look forward to seeing you then. And I also look forward to completely unplugging. I am, I am uh, going out of town this last weekend before the semester starts. I will be traveling back on Tuesday and I will have my computer to check email. Um, but I am practicing self-care by taking a long weekend away and taking Friday off entirely. Um, and I hope that reinforces some of the stuff that I said in the um, syllabus video that, you know, when we need to practice self-care, we practice self-care. And I have built flexibility into this course so that you can do that and still um, you know, get a grade that would be the same as if you hadn't. Um, and lots of learning opportunities so that you can still learn deeply and broadly the same material while being able to do that. And I thank you in advance for recognizing that Liz and uh, Greta and I are all finite human beings who sometimes are gonna need the same level of grace as well. Um, and I hope that this is uh, that this is as fun a semester for you as I'm sure it will be for all of us, because this is material that this material brings us to topics and issues that are um, are endlessly fascinating. And I really look forward to being able to share that with you 
And for those of you who end up not loving it, for at least giving you something useful that you can take away for the with and keep with you for the rest of, of your lives, I hope. Bye-bye.